Thank you, team. Welcome. Aren't we thankful for all the bugs that have been killed the last couple of days? <laughs> There's some benefits. Uh, thankful for warm houses and family. Time away from our normal routines. We hope you've got some break from work. It's good to see some families uh, here tonight together and guests uh, worshiping with us. And I just want to say uh, welcome to each one of you and Merry Christmas. Uh, we were talking earlier and I mentioned it earlier today to someone in our family that uh, because of the time zones, uh, Bethlehem's already on Christmas Day. So this is both a Christmas Eve service here and a Christmas Day service there as we celebrate happy birthday to Jesus. So uh, we're covering them both. Now that's not why we are chose not to meet tomorrow, but uh, we trust that tomorrow uh, or over the next uh, week of holiday time that you would uh, just please uh, think of others in our church family, give them a call, be hospitable, uh, pray for them. Uh, there's some in our church family that uh, this is a very unique Christmas. And I'm thinking of uh, Chris and Jean Stevens as they uh, continue to wait day by day and maybe even hour by hour for their oldest son Scott to anticipate to pass here at any time. And for them, each Christmas going forward is just going to be a little different, isn't it? Not bad, but different. When they give it to the Lord, uh, God can use those things to, to change who we are and how we think about these, this, this moment. Well, the last song that we... Oh, my name is Pastor Van. I'm one of the elders here. Let me just... Some of you are visiting and wondering uh, whose turn it is. Uh, you met Pastor Greg earlier, uh, Pastor Steve's sitting over there, welcome sir, stay awake, and uh, Pastor Will and his wife Kim are in the beautiful uh, reaches of Southern California, and so uh, hope they're doing all right with all those bugs. <laughs> Heard that, Kathy. <laughs> uh, Matthew chapter 2, if you have your Bibles or your phones, Bibles are great because you can mark them up a bit. Matthew chapter 2, and uh, we're going to continue on in the Christmas story. Uh, David and the worship team uh, led us through Luke chapter 2 and the visit of the shepherds to Bethlehem, to the manger on that evening that Jesus was born. And uh, tonight, we're just going to look at a second aspect of the Christmas story, which is the story of the wise men. And uh, full, just to get it out there, uh, a lot of Christmas traditions, Christmas cards, Christmas songs, hymns, <laughs> uh, beautiful poems, manger scenes. Uh, photos uh, don't quite put the wise men where they belong. Uh, so we're going to just look at that tonight, and I don't want to get into uh, all the, the details of, of correcting what's wrong, but I want to see what actually is just in this passage in Matthew 2. And uh, I got to practice it last night. Last night I was with uh, four young guys at the Green County Juvenile Detention Center. And uh, it was a, a great conversation through Matthew chapter one and two, actually. Uh, some of you perhaps are familiar with Matthew chapter one. Matthew chapter one takes us through one of those uh, couple of places in the New Testament where there's a list of names. And when you get to those spots in the Old Testament, sometimes that's when you just really wonder 
what's going on here and why did they bother to tell us who his son had who is and then he keeps going and begat 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 father of father of father of over and over and over again but Matthew as he writes the gospel the account of Jesus king Jesus the king of the Jews he takes us back to the genealogy of Jesus very similar to what the Old Testament writings would have been because those folks in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, many of them were looking for, anticipating the Messiah to come. They were waiting for the anointed one, the promised one. And way back in Genesis 3.15, God said that that promised one would come. And one day, the serpent, the evil one, would bruise his heel but that the Messiah would ultimately crush the serpent's head and do away with evil. And from that moment to Abraham and, or Abram in Genesis 12, where God made a covenant with him and said that one of your descendants is going to be, bring a blessing to the whole world, to all people. And then we get to King David and we get a little other clue that this descendant is going to be a king, a descendant of David. And Matthew, when he goes through the genealogy right there in chapter 1, highlights Abraham and highlights David. And at the end of that list, gets to Jesus. And all this anticipation for thousands of years of where's the answer to the sin problem? Where's the answer to my son Cain killing Abel? Where's the answer to all the evil at the time of Noah and the time of the judges? Where's even the answer for King David when he sinned against the Lord? Adultery and murder. Right? Where's the answer? And they waited and waited and waited. And then in God's perfect time, as we read it this, morning, uh, this evening, Caesar Augustus began to move. Mary and Elizabeth. John the Baptist. And God's plan started to unfold in a perfect way at a perfect time. And we get to Matthew chapter 2. Let's read a little bit and just uh, to give you a heads up, we're going to uh, break this, these 12 verses down into three sections. Uh, they're not going to be equally balanced, but uh, each section I just want to draw out a truth for us to think about this evening. Okay, so if you would with me please, Matthew chapter 2, just follow along as I read these first two verses. After Jesus was born... In Bethlehem, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, or when it rose, and have come to worship him. So let's just look at these two verses. Let me just draw out a few things. This is sometime after the birth of Jesus. We'll find out later that they came to Bethlehem, but Jesus was with his parents in a house. We'll also get a little clue that it was several months, maybe a year, maybe even close to two years after the birth of Jesus that they arrived when King Herod learned about that and when they first saw the star. And so when Herod did his awful thing of, of killing the babies aged two years and under, that would have been a safe window where he thought he was going to get rid of Christ, right? To get rid of this threat to him. And so, sometime after the birth of Jesus, it also probably has to be at least eight days after his birth because on the eighth day, according to the Jewish custom, Mary and Joseph took Jesus into the temple to, to have him concentrated, consecrated to the Lord, the firstborn male son, and circumcised there. And they offered a pigeon or a dove, the, the cheapest, the least expensive of an acceptable sacrifice. And if the wise men would have already visited them and brought gifts to them, 
it seems like they probably would have been able to afford a, a more costly sacrifice, right? But somewhere after the birth of Jesus, he was born in Bethlehem. That's consistent with what we had in the book of Luke. During the time of King Herod. Uh, King Herod's a bad guy. King Herod was put in place by the Roman Empire, and his job was to keep that region of Judea peaceful, under wraps. Like, and the Jewish people were always the, the troublemakers, it seemed, in the Roman Empire, always having these little skirmishes going on and re trying to reject the rule of the Roman Empire. So Herod had a tough job. One of the things Herod was doing to try to, I guess, by the Jews' favor was he was investing a lot of funds into building, remodeling the temple called Herod's Temple. And during the time of Christ, that temple was still being built during Christ's life, uh, invested by the Roman go government, something that Herod had done. Uh, Herod, as he got older, and this is probably just a year or two before he died, he became very paranoid. Uh, he eliminated uh, on purpose one of his wives, at least two of his boys, sons. He was afraid they were going to take his throne and usurp his power. Uh, there was a saying at the time that historian accounts that it'd be safer to be a son of Herod, I'm sorry, safer to be a pig of Herod than a son of Herod. Uh, he's getting rid of sons more than he's getting rid of his livestock. Uh, also, right before his death, according to accounts, he had a whole bunch of Jewish people arrested, falsely accused, and imprisoned. And he instructed his guards that on the night of his death or the day of his death, that these people all had to be executed. And the reason was... This is our friend King Herod now. The reason was, is he wanted to hear the sound, have the sound of weeping and wailing being heard when he died. And he knew that wouldn't happen if just he had died. And so all these others would have died too that same day. And the people would have been weeping and wailing over their deaths as opposed to celebrating the death of Herod. Just a wicked man, an evil man late in his life, very paranoid it says there, during his time, that magi or wise men, okay? Uh, we just don't know much about them. They came from the eastern regions. How far east? Uh, there's some evidence that maybe toward Babylon, toward Persia, uh, that maybe that's where these uh, individuals came. Uh, they were probably uh, seekers of knowledge. They were probably university professors of some sort who loved to research, loved to figure things out. And apparently, at least for some of these magi, they had a special interest in astronomy also the movement of the heavenly bodies. And they kept their eyes on the sky, but they also apparently had some knowledge about the Old Testament Hebrew writings. And perhaps this makes a little sense because uh, several years before this, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and many other Jewish people were exiled in Babylon, eventually became Persia, the Persian Empire there. Ezekiel was there. So it's very likely that a lot of the Hebrew writings were accessible in the universities or in this place where these wise learners of the books and of the skies would have been studying. And somehow they noticed something unusual in the heavens. Now, a few years back, uh, it was all the rage that it was Halley's Comet. 
because Halley's Comet has a certain period of its uh, revolution, revolution through, the, uh, through the solar system. And uh, yes, somewhere close to two or three AD, at the time close to where Jesus was, Halley's Comet uh, would have been visible, but uh, we don't know that it was a comet, and I'm not sure that that would be that unusual if they were astronomers, because they probably would have a record of that coming 70 or 80 years prior to that. It was a pretty regular appearance of Halley's Comet. Uh, I've also read and heard that it was when Jupiter and Saturn, the two planets that have been quite visible here this past fall in our sky, that very early in the ADs, those two planets would have been very, very close together and would have been exceptionally bright in the sky. Again, we have no idea. I, I probably would just assume that God placed a special light in the heavens that caught their attention. And I assume that these guys, when they saw this bright light in the heavens, tried to figure out, well, what's that mean? And according to some of the customs and teaching in history, when a star arrives, when a light arrives, that means there's going to be a new ruler. And that one ruler is going to be replaced by a new ruler. And in the Hebrew Scriptures, it said that that new ruler would come as a Jew in Judea and that like that's going to be like the promised one for years and years and years well if this great star this great light means there's a new ruler like what could be the 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 greatest event that could be happening perhaps it's the birth of this jewish king and i don't know how many were in persia or babylon or there getting together but a few of the guys said well let's go check it out and I wonder what their wives thought. And I wonder what the rest of the guys thought in their small group when Mo, Larry, and Curly, whoever they were, said, let's go see. And if it was from Persia or Babylon, it's probably a six, seven, or 800 mile journey. Not a flight. Probably not a comfortable ride, but a walk and maybe a ride with a little bounce to it on a horse or on a camel. And for weeks and weeks or months, they headed towards Judea. Why? On a pretty good hunch that maybe this bright light that we saw matches up to these Hebrew scriptures that says there's going to be a king coming. And somehow within them, they were moved to go look for Jesus. Something changed in their thinking enough to say, we want to go explore this some more. We want to find out something more. And in fact, they went to great lengths to go look for Jesus because of the hint of the star and the hint of the scriptures, it was enough to compel them to go search for Jesus. All right, let's stop here. Here's our first point for this evening. Uh, those of you that are guests, uh, I'd like you to participate and our children are in here and this is a moment for you to participate too. I often ask our folks to participate actively. So I want you to think about and then share with a neighbor here briefly, if you would, please. Who are those people? What are some of the circumstances that have helped you in your journey to find Jesus, to believe in Jesus, to follow Jesus. A parent, a teacher, a car accident, a tornado. What could you just tell a neighbor and say, 
I'm thankful to God that he used this person or is using this person. If you're a child, who are those people that are helping you to have an interest in Jesus? For these wise men, it was a star and the scriptures. Okay, have some of you got some thoughts and ideas in your mind, in your hearts? So, uh, if you have a neighbor sitting really close by, it's easier if someone says, ask the question first, or you can just start saying, hey, I'm thankful that this happened, or so-and-so has helped me to learn about Jesus. And maybe it's since your moment of salvation, what has helped you to grow in learning more about Jesus? Go. Talk to your neighbor just for a minute. I'm just going to give you a second. What are those things? Who are those people? I probably can't talk very loud. I had some wonderful youth pastors who would shoot baskets with me in the gym for hours. Along with Sue Kellard, who I talked about a couple weeks ago, my Sunday school teacher. My parents, who took me places as a child. To take me to Sunday school, take me to church. So, somehow, God has moved around in circumstances and in ways in your life that your lives intersected with the right people in the right places, at the right places, right? At the right time. At a time when you were teachable, at a time when your heart was tender, at a time when you were looking forward and trying to figure out what is God doing and right there was somebody helping you to get to God. And most of you probably shared some very normal, simple things. doesn't take miracles. It takes people who are faithful to say, will you come to blast with our family? Somebody who says, before we eat, let's pray. To demonstrate before your family that God has some significance, some importance. Right? Like, I don't want you to to think in your own lives that you have to contribute in some special, miraculous way. By you just living faithfully and obeying God, you could be used to help others, our next generation. The ones in this room that during our singing were in the back dancing and singing with their own cries of, Joy, laughter, and frustration. <laughs> but we get, to, uh, we get to be that star to help them to see Jesus. All right. All right, our second one. Let's keep reading here. Actually, I'll uh, start here at verse 2, and we'll just keep going. He said, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when we were in the east, when it rose in the east, and we've come to worship him. It does not say that they followed a star. It says that they saw the star and, and uh, we don't know if they did have the star in their sight the whole time or not, but certainly it seems like the bright light that's unusual and the scriptures got them moving. They head to Judea and they go to Jerusalem and verse 3 it says, when King Herod 
our mean, nasty king, heard this. He was disturbed. He was shaken. And all Jerusalem with him. Why would King Herod be a little shaken and upset? Well, two possible reasons. One is, hey, who here in Jerusalem knows where this new king is? And the word's spreading around town, and finally he requests the Magi to come, or they come to him, the wise men, and they're like, we're, we're looking for the new king of the Jews. And so just the idea of a threat of another king, when he is the proclaimed as the king of the Jews, that might have him shaken up a little bit too. Also, we don't know how big this caravan was, this group of wise men and all of their folks that were traveling with them, how large of a group it was coming from Persia that just their presence in the city might have caused a little bit of folks to be a little disturbed. What's going on here? What's the big event? Right? And then it says that all Jerusalem was disturbed with the king. Well, either way, there's something special, there's something big going on. I wonder what that is. Or the king's a little disturbed. That's never a good thing. Right? So we don't know what it is, but it's got the attention of people in Jerusalem. Verse 4. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the wise men Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen, when it rose, went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We'll stop right there. Uh, Three responses to this event. Herod. Uh, Herod's a fake. He's a hypocrite. He's a fraud. He said, I want to go and worship when he really wanted to go and get rid of Jesus. The religious leaders, I don't know if you caught this, but he wasn't familiar with the Old Testament writings, but he knew there were a lot of Jews who were very interested. And he said to them, hey, there's these men here from Persia, from Babylon, from the east. They're looking here in Jerusalem for the king. You would think the king would be in Jerusalem, a major city. They're looking. Do you know in your writings? And as they opened the scrolls or had it memorized, they immediately knew this king was going to be born in Bethlehem. So think of these wise men who've traveled six, seven, eight hundred miles and the Jewish religious leaders who were five or six miles from Bethlehem. And the Jewish leaders knew, but they didn't move. They didn't go. They were really quite disinterested in knowing the Word of God. Now, they knew God's words, but they were right, quite content with their pursuit of the law, their pursuit of doing, of of trying to honor God by their obedience. And it turned into not much different than Herod, a hypocritical obedience, right? Like on the outside, we have to do these things, but their hearts were far. And all they had to do 
I mean, there, there, there's this excitement. We've come this far, these wise men are saying, hundreds of miles. Where is he? Well, according to the scriptures, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And they're like, well, we're going. And the religious Jewish people stayed. There's nothing here in the text that said they get up and moved. They were disinterested. What about the wise men? That's who we like to focus on, right? Because they finished their journey. They went to Bethlehem. It's interesting that uh, it says here that when they left Jerusalem that the star appeared in the sky. It seems like it probably had disappeared for a time being. And maybe just while they were in the city or maybe it was that they just appeared when they were in Persia and it was enough to draw them to Jerusalem. But it appeared again and it says that they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Joy on top of joy. They rejoiced greatly there. They were filled with joy when they saw the star. Why? Because it was another clue, another hint, another little message from God. Was it Psalm uh, 19? The heavens declare the glory of God and the, the stars, the planets speak forth. Well, the message they got again was the star came back in the sky and they're like, oh, we must be on the right, right way. And they went into Bethlehem and they found the baby and said when they saw him, they immediately, what? They bowed down and worshipped him and then gave him gifts. Then gave him gifts. For our second point tonight, it's this. I don't want us to miss the Herod character. Because in our Christian life, all of us have a Herod in us. All of us want to stay on the throne and not step aside and let Jesus rule. All right, there's two kings in this story. There's even two kings of the Jews here. And I think we're really, really quick to say, well, we're, we want to be like the wise men. We're, we're the wise men. We, we're here on a Christmas Eve worshiping. Maybe. Or maybe we're like the religious leaders that this is just what we do. But an encounter with Jesus, we're not really interested in that. We just want to be able to let people know around us that this Christianity thing is something that we want them to think we're good at doing. So what's the Herod in our hearts? What's the place where King Jesus would say, you're not letting me have it, own it, control it. You're holding on to that, trying to control and manage it yourself. Let me be the king of your time, of your values, of your finances. Let me be the king of your children and grandchildren. I've got them. Who can take care of them better, you or Jesus? You have nothing to contribute at night while your kids are asleep and you're asleep. And it's by God's grace and goodness that they wake up in the morning and you too. But we all get Herod or the religious leaders that comes up in our hearts from time to time. And how do we get rid of Herod? We repent and we confess. And we say, God, forgive us. And I release 
this to you. And it's okay to say that over and over again. Because Herod just keeps popping up sometimes in the same spot in your life. And then when you, by God's mercy and the power of the Spirit, begin to get victory over this Herod in this spot, uh, don't rest too secure because he'll pop up someplace else. So in this second section, is there a place for you tonight to just stop in this moment and say, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a fraud. I don't want to say Jesus is my king and like Herod, I want to go worship him. When in reality, you just want him to get out of the way because he's bothering you. why we as a church practice communion once in a while, right? Monthly or why is that? Because it's a time to take account. Well, every time we open God's word, every time we are exposed to it, every time we just hear the spirits convicting of sin, it's the same remedy. We gotta get rid of Herod. Repent, confess, and ask for forgiveness. The third one is simply verse 12. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. They went another way. You know, it would have made perfect sense for them to go back to Herod because Herod and the religious teachers were part of how they found Jesus. Right? Like, God used Herod and the religious teachers to get him to Bethlehem. It seems normal that you would go back and say, thank you for telling me, and we found Jesus. And they're living at the house there on Maple Street or whatever it was. Right? That seems like the right thing to do. But that night, they had a dream that was kind of like the star, except in this dream, they said that they heard, it's written here, that God told them they had to go a different route. Don't go back to the king. Now, who do they listen to? The king, Herod, who said, come back. And their reason and their, like, it'd be normal. We should go back to the king. He helped us. He asked us to come back. Or do we listen to this voice, this dream that we've had, that we've discerned is the voice of God and do what God says. So, as we close here in this last section, it's this. In this moment, they went against their plans to follow God's plans, to follow God's way. They chose to obey God and go another way. You know, they bowed to Jesus and presented him gifts. And to worship Jesus always requires obedience. It's an expression of our worship. It's an expression of our faith. Jesus said in his own words later in the Gospels, that if you love me, you will keep my commandments you will do what I ask you to do even if it seems like it's a different way different from what you expected different from what everybody else is doing different what seems to be this makes a whole lot of sense 
that if God clearly speaks and says, no, go a different way, we're all faced with that choice. Right? Every day in our Christian walk, we're faced with, are we going to go the different way? Am I willing to trust God to obey Him and to go the way that He asked me to go? In Romans chapter 12, it says this, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. To let go of your way, of your will, and say, I am going to follow God. I'm willing to go another way. Later on in that passage, Romans 12, here's the way that God is asking all of us to go. Are you willing to go this way? Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. I read this, uh, I don't know, a while back and it stuck with me. And it's written in a little journal and I pray through it sometimes. But the way that, the way that God reveals to us our, our idols, our unwillingness to serve or love someone else, is when he asks us to serve those who criticize us or serve those who treat us like servants. That's the hardest. That it exposes what's in his heart. And are we willing to go the other way? Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Or just a couple of verses in Ephesians 4. Put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Is that the other way? In your anger, do not sin. Anyone who's been stealing, you must steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with your own hands. Then you'll have something to share with those in need. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That's the other way, right? But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, and every form of malice. You know what the other way is? Be kind. Be kind. In my mind, that just covers a lot. That stinking little word, be kind. That's the other way. And compassionate. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And I ask that God's Spirit would help us to be willing. When we open up the Bible, sometimes we, in our Bible study, we finish with application. Uh, maybe a better way to think about that is so now how can I obey what I just read? I mean, that is application, but sometimes application sounds like it's just a general principle for God's people as opposed to, 
I've just read this. Will I obey it? What is God asking me to do? And I thank the Lord for a church family that we get to help each other in that journey. That together as a church family we can be part of those praises and thanksgivings of helping people to come to Jesus. As a church family, we can help to expose people's blind spots and the herods that we start to see and we can go up to a brother or sister lovingly and let them know that wasn't right. And that together, we can encourage each other to go the way that God asks us to go. The other way. Ask Jared and Hillary to come on up here and let me just close our time in prayer and then they're going to light the last candle, the one that represents the birth of Jesus. God, thank you for these words from Matthew 2. Might your spirit take your truth And as we've been exposed to the light of the truth, might we, like the wise men, get up and move towards Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.